Now you're welcome along. It's week four of our series with Professor Paul Rouse. We are looking at the history of sport effectively, uh, largely in Ireland and the UK and a little bit beyond as well. We are into week four. Uh, Paul, a professor at UCD School of History, a published author as well, Sport in Ireland, the History, uh, one of the books we've talked to him about several times on the show. And we are into week four of this series. Paul, how are you doing? Very well, thanks, Joe. How are you keeping? I'm very well as well. So if people are listening on the radio, uh, by all means, you don't need to have heard episodes one, two and three. This is not a true crime series, but we are podcasting the full series and uh, you can get all the episodes there. At the moment, it's in the off the ball highlights section and in due course, very soon, in fact, we'll just put up a a sport Ireland history type uh, category all on its own and you can get the full series there. So in the main over the last uh, three weeks or so, we've kind of done this in linear fashion. We're not doing that all the way through. For week four, we're focusing on two of the really big sports, in particular soccer and rugby, and looking more to the UK firstly as uh, the, you know, the, the, maybe the more interesting aspect of, of soccer and rugby and how it came into existence. And then we'll look at how it, we'll look at how it affected Ireland in due course. Yeah, we, we, you cannot talk about the modern sporting world without talking about soccer and rugby and to understand why soccer and rugby are so important as games and so important in Ireland, you have to look at the origins of those games, how they were made, why they were made the way they were, why soccer in particular became so important and why rugby um, also uh, retained, took the shape that it took as, as, as a sport. Now, obviously, these games cross these organized games in their modern organized fashion cross the IRC almost immediately uh, in terms of rugby, uh, but then very quickly in terms of soccer um, from from Britain to Ireland. They were, they were both islands united in one kingdom at this period. But the, the foundation of the games and their early development in England must be examined if you are to understand modern Ireland sport. Like this is these are these are. Uh, as you say, a series in which we're discussing Irish sport, but the idea that Ireland is just an island and that it hasn't absorbed waves of sporting innovation from elsewhere, mm. uh, of course, would be nonsensical to argue. And no wave of sporting engagement has been quite as important to the development of Irish sport as that the, the origins and development of soccer and rugby. So the English game is on Netflix. They've given the origins of modern soccer, the Netflix treatment. And I was meant to watch this. I didn't for two reasons. One, it's been panned by everybody I've asked who has seen it. And secondly, as much as I wanted to give it a look over the last 24 hours, the last dance just dropped and the lure of Michael J- or Jordan was just too much. Uh, but I, So the English game, a lot of people will have seen this on Netflix. Have you watched much of it? So this is real dog eat my homework kind of stuff, Joe. You had two weeks here <laughs> to to do a very simple piece of work, and it's it's fairly disappointing now that you you didn't didn't do this. Was this a kind of a regular occurrence when you were? No, I was, I was, in the main, I was pretty good. We've been busy putting together three hour nightly shows and six hour shows at the weekends, but you know. Again, the excuses keep rolling, yeah, Joe. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so I watched the first episode of it, and um, it's ah. Uh, it, it it's not great, right? There's no. It was kind of enjoyable, on one level, but um, I don't think I'll go back to it. And unlike you, I, I I got into the Michael Jordan show yesterday as well. So I had intended to watch a couple more yesterday evening, but it just right, okay. went. There we go. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a bit of a tone to that there, John. <laughs> really. Yeah. Do as I uh, say, not as I do. That's what I'm hearing here. Well, absolutely. Um, no, so, so it has been panned. And what it did in the episode that I saw, it set up a kind of a, a cartoon version of the origins of soccer, and in particular the pre- professionalization of soccer, in which there was, on the one hand, the extremes of the English public schoolboy with all the privilege that that held. And on the other hand, there were the mill workers and mine workers and Scots and that there was no middle ground between the two and that this was a battle for the control of what ultimately became the people's game. Mm. And like all of these things, there is an element of truth in this at the margins. That's exactly how it worked. But it's much more complicated, much more complex than, than as you would expect. Yeah. It is, after all, 
the English uh, the English game. It's 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 not a documentary. It's a it's 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 a show. And what are the origins of uh, football in the UK? I know you mentioned in your notes uh, Shakespeare mentions it. Wordsworth mentions it. When does this first come into existence in, in any kind of recognisable form? There are centuries of reference in English culture through law and through, through, um, through poetry and through plays and later in newspaper reports to people in England playing a game which was called football. Now, was there a game called football? No, that's the wrong way of putting it. There were games of football organised on a local basis all across England, there was no calendar of play in which um, there was a national league or a national competition. There was no governing body. There were no particular organised clubs up mm-hmm. until the 19th century. What you had were localised traditions of play and the rules of that particular local area varied according to the geography in which the game was played, to the nature of the ball in which it played and of that tradition of play. And they weren't set in stone, so they changed over time. This is not to say by the way, there were, there were incidents through law. It's quite clear that these games were exceptionally physical in certain instances and they could lead to riot and they could lead to village against village conflict. But equally, that's, they, they are exceptions, it would appear. There was a great ritual of playing uh, a game called football in, in villages and towns and later in cities all across England uh, through the centuries, mentioned, as you say, in Shakespeare's plays, mentioned by Wordsworth um, and so on. So it was a really, really popular game to play football very, in whatever variation. Okay. So I know you want to talk about public schools and their importance and their role in establishing a football as we know it. Uh, first of all, what exactly are we talking about here when we say public schools in presumably the 19th century we're talking about? We t- we'll talk about the 19th century. If you look at w- what we're talking about when it comes to public schools are really not public schools at all. They're fee-paying elitist institutions, mm-hmm. ordinarily boarding schools, although also taking in day pupils in certain instances. I suppose the most famous would be Eton School, which was founded in the 15th century, but there's also a rugby school founded in the 16th century, Harrow in the 16th century, Winchester back in the 14th century, and so on. So the elite uh, public schools of England, always fee-paying schools in uh, the, the elite of English society traditionally went. Now, in the 19th century, those schools began to take in many, many more students because, because of the prosperity of England and the Industrial Revolution and the amount of money flowing now into English society, being drawn in from the empire as it expanded around the world. Mm-hmm. And the Industrial Revolution moved through stages. We talked, um, the last time we were, we were discussing this on, on, uh, about how the Industrial Revolution was a process which took part place over 80, 90 years and led to the introduction of factory life, um, urban living and everything around that. But it came in different stages and the great transition after 1850 was the growth in, in the number of people with desk jobs. So people who worked as, in clerical work in England grew from about 100,000 in the 1850s to, about, to more than 500,000 in the 1890s. So this is the next wave goes on and r- around those jobs Mm. were other clerical type jobs, desk jobs, basically, um, civil servants, people then who went in and worked in the professions, all of which were expanding in this age. So you've got between 1850 and, 18, uh, and, 80, and 1900, a kind of an expanding middle yeah. class in England. And this is, these are, this is a prospering middle class who have aspirations for, the, for their families and for themselves. And they want to buy in to a, to a certain form of life. And part of this, is now sending their kids to these schools. Okay. And are they playing football at these schools? I mean, you would traditionally, certainly today, associate them more with rugby. Yeah, they're playing a game called football. You have to stop. You have to not think about this as either either soccer or rugby in the period before 1860. What you have here are these schools, decade after decade, lay out green, grassy areas in the centuries beforehand. And the kids come together on these on these um, pitches and play variations of forms of game. In rugby school, for example, 300 boys used to mill around the pitch with a football in the afternoons. It was a great way. The masters insisted on, on boys playing because it was a great way to kind of get the energy out of them before they had to go to study and then they would calm down. And these schools were, were incredibly unruly. 
uh, before the 19th century. There were riots in in Eton and several years, or in in and in rugby in several years during this period. So um, it was a kind of a real godsend to them. And of course, from this shapeless play, local forms of football began to develop. So there were a set of rules by which they played in Eton and a set of rules in rugby and a set of rules in Harrow and so on, okay. depending on the shape of the pitch that the school had at its disposal right. and on what the boys decided to do. So the notion that everything was in perfect harmony and then William Webb Ellis decided to pick up the ball, can you imagine, and create rugby is as fanciful as it gets. Uh, the, the William Webb Ellis story is a remarkable like the fact that the William Webb Ellis, the fact that the Rugby World Cup is played for the William Webb Ellis Trophy is it's it's laughable. Uh, the idea that William Webb Ellis invented rugby by catching a ball for the first time that it was ever caught in the game in 1823 and ran between 300 boys who were obviously trying to take his head off is is nonsensical. This big yeah. ban explanation. There's actually a, a really interesting um, thing. Uh, General Ono Duffy who later was such a was, was so, so central to the Irish Revolution. He kind of postulated this theory in the 1920s and 1930s that William Webb Ellis, in doing this, actually was emulating, was emulating the Gaelic footballers of Tipperary because William Webb Ellis' father had been based in Tipperary as an army officer mm. in the 1810s, or and before that, before the 1810s. And the idea was, according to General Lono Duffy, that actually rugby was a mere imitation of Gaelic football because William Webb Ellis had seen this. Now, William Webb Ellis, his father, was in Ireland before Webb Ellis was even one year old. So even if he had been over with his father, the chances are he didn't quite pick it up. Yes. Look, we all enjoy it. And anyway, Gaelic football didn't exist in uh, that period. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I don't know if you know this, but the Hill 16 is built from the rubble or was of the 1960s. <laughs> Easter Rising Paul. So, you know, these, these things. That's, are, <laughs> we haven't got there yet. So. Uh, so, okay, so that's what's happening in public schools, and it varies from pitch to pitch and, and, and geographically and culturally. And then, but there is a sort of a field game, a, a hybrid of uh, football and rugby ongoing. You mentioned the 1850s. I know in your notes as well, you said from about the 1850s on, uh, we start seeing the first football clubs in London, certainly. Yeah, so what happened was. As, as these boys who like playing football in the schools, football and various sports became central to the code of these schools. So to play for the school team became a big thing. And there was a bit of, bit of an idea that you would, um, it was a kind of, there were two things. It was godliness and good learning and sport were all wrapped together as a character building thing in the idea of these schools. And of course, these boys were meant to go out and serve the empire. This is where, this was utterly crucial to the idea of Englishness and then of Britishness and then to the empire. That, right. that you've heard that phrase repeated about the, 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 the playing fields of Eton being utterly critical to, to the establishment of the empire and the winning of battles and, and everything to, to, to do with that. But when these boys went out into various places, they took their games with them. There were obviously the boys who were made play and who hated it. And then there were those who loved playing sport and didn't think that just because they'd turned 20 or 21 that they should stop playing. So those who went on, the elite few who went on to university, to Cambridge and to Oxford, began to play games together. And they tried in the 1840s to get a combined set of rules and came up with the Cambridge rules. Now, there were disagreement between the various people who came from Eton or Harrow as to what those rules should be when they were there. They all believed in the prestige of their own public school. Mm. But so they kind of, it didn't really take off those Cambridge rules of the 1840s. And then when people went on into London in the 1850s, they set up clubs such as Blackheath and Richmond in the 1850s, and they each played by their individual rules. And when they came to play each other, they either played by the uh, rules of one of the clubs, or they kind of combined their rules for a game on the day. So into the 1850s, there were more and more football clubs being established, each by their own set of rules. And there was no combined set of rules for all of these schools, okay. or for all of these clubs. Which brings us to 1863 and the Football Association. This is the FA as we know it, is it? It is the FA uh, as, as we know it. Um, the first meeting was held in the Freemasons Tavern in, in London on the 26th of October, 1863. A group of people from the schools and from the existing clubs um, around London only came in here and they established in a series of five or six meetings over the next two months 
what became known as the Football Association, which they agreed uh, was the Football Association. And there were disputes as to what the nature of this game should be. And it came down to two basic things. Was this game going to be a catch and, a catch and run game? And most games in all the public schools involved handling of the ball. So it was a feeling that it should be catch and run. Or should it be a dribbling, kicking game? So should the ball either be on the ground or should it be in your hand and you running with it? So mm. there the, that's the first divide. And the second divide was whether hacking should be allowed. Now, hacking was a practice um, which developed in rugby school as, as one of the things. And hacking is um, basically involved the deliberate kicking in the, uh, the shins of your, of your opponent. So uh, I, you're coming forward with the ball. The ball's on the ground. You're rushing it forward. As part of a ground, and I just I let I let fly whether the ball is near you or not, and I just let fly at your shin. I mean, there were there was a certain etiquette to it. You weren't meant to use your heel when you hacked the other person, and you weren't meant to kick above the knee. But this was pretty physical, and there was a view that that's one thing if you're a schoolboy and not able to go to class the next day. But if you're meant to be going in to a courtroom, or you're meant to go in to be a doc, to a, to into a surgery or whatever. It's slightly different mm. if you're, if you're well, if you're unable to walk. It's it's uh, it takes it out of it. So, um, and in the original rules that they formulated for the football association on the first of December, you could actually run with the ball in the hand. That was the draft rules. Right. But then, over the next, something happened in those meetings. It's not quite clear exactly what happened, but it was decided that no, ultimately we're taking out running with the ball in the hand, and we're taking out hacking. So is that, these rules. is that where as a historian you just have to say, well, something happened in those meetings, we don't quite know what? There is a dispute over it and there is no shame in people saying there's a, there's a, there's a capacity, there's, there's a pretense in history that you must offer a neat explanation for things. And the minute you hear a neat explanation for much of history, the alarm bells should, should ring, number one. Number two, one of the most difficult things I think in history is to work out the motivations for why people do things and what pushes them to do things. It is the great challenge of history. Now, you can ordinarily, or in very many instances, assess the evidence and make a very strong case for, 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 for doing this. But the capacity of people to misremember, to invent, and to outright lie as explanations for why these things means we must be cautious as, yeah. as to, why, to why things happen. So. Um, the FA, in its first published rule book, decided you could catch the ball if it came to you, but you must drop it immediately and kick it. You couldn't run with it. Right. And number one, and number two, you were not allowed hack. You could not deliberately kick in the leg your opponent. And from these and around these rules, the Football Association um, was formed. And immediately there was a split. Oh, was there? Okay. So immediately, immediately there were a group of clubs that said, look, this is... This is uh, absolutely outrageous and one man Campbell uh, who was representing one of the London clubs who declined to join the Football Association gave that ultimate insult to Englishmen and said that look if, if, you, if you want to invent a game like that you're even Frenchmen could come over and beat us um, if you don't want to if, you were, if you're going to take all the manliness out of, mm-hmm. out of this sport yeah. and um, so there was a, there, were, there were a group of 20, 20 clubs based around who were used to games in which you could run with the ball in your hand and you were allowed hack, who basically said, no, we're not joining this. Off right. you go. Good luck. Right. You know, it's interesting, uh, the hacking thing, like that has survived in the lexicon to this day. I mean, it is still common terminology. If we, you know, we're playing football, bad tackle, and you'll say he's after hacking me. Absolutely. And the idea of a player being, being a hacker and also the idea yeah. that there are not too many teams win championships without having somebody who can do a small bit of hacking uh, re- re- remains the case. Yeah, that's very interesting. So uh, they, they, the manly uh, clubs go off and, and continue their hacking and uh, catching the ball. You, so the, the FA rules, as in you can't hack and you can't uh, handle the ball, they, they obviously continue. Does this thing explode? Like, is this, is, does this, the, the gospel spread pretty immediately from 1863? I think one of the, the interesting things about soccer is if you look around the modern world it is, and you're interested in sport and you see the ubiquity, ubiquity of soccer, you would, you would almost imagine that it was inevitable 
yeah. that, that, this is, that this sport is so popular. It is the global game, the people's game, the beautiful game, whatever cliche people want to put around it. And it's hard to imagine a sporting world without it. But the truth of it is there was nothing inevitable about this progress. There was nothing inevitable about the idea that, that soccer would thrive or, or triumph or even survive at the beginning because through the 1860s, soccer really did not spread or the Football Association did not spread its rules beyond a core group of clubs who were, um, who were active in the London area. And by 1867, there were fewer than 20 clubs who were, and, and you think of the size of England at this stage, more than 30 million people living um, on, the, uh, on the island in Britain in general, and the, the, the population growing year after year and there are fewer than 20 clubs who give their affiliation to the football association and play by the rules and it comes to the point where there is consideration giving to disbandment of the football association and that it rules and that it rules might die wow well then can i because you can explain to me then what happens here or in so much as you can because i know from the, the notes you sent on the fa cup of 1871 FA Cup, yeah. know, 15 teams, a measly 15 teams in 1871. Uh, seven years later in 1878, there are 43 teams in the FA Cup. And then 1880s, uh, simply you have written down explosion. So something happens. Yeah, so something happens. And it's a reminder that um, the capacity of people of wealth and money to write history means that for very many years, this English game story of this being the game of the English public school, which was then given to the working class man. Uh, because of course, this was all about men. There was no idea that women would play or no suggestion that women should play in these games at this stage. But the idea that this was a game handed down from the betters to those who were in the lower strata of society is of course a nonsense once you look at the details. And there's an excellent historian, Adrian Harvey, who works in England, who turned this narrative on its head. And he very clearly showed the other traditions him amongst others have shown the other traditions of play in places like Cumbria, across Scotland, across the north of England, where football did not die in, as it was supposed to have done in the post-industrial revolution period, or the industrial revolution period in England. That there were the older traditions of playing were still there. And those clubs who played set up their own rules. So, for example, you have Sheffield Football Club, founded in 1857, had its own rules, which were written in 1858, and spread across Yorkshire. Okay. So they had their own, they had their own games. And by 1867, there were 14 clubs involved in the Sheffield F uh, Football Association, more than 1,000 players, and they were modifying the rules to draw in some clubs and, and all of that. So there were other traditions. There was not just the London Football Association with everything that... that that was given down from the elite down. It was much more, it was much more complicated than that. So a couple of things happened. How did it come to pass that, um, that the two, that the football association came to dominate? And you focus on two basic things. First of all, the establishment of the FA Cup, in no particular order, the establishment of the FA Cup in 1871 really mattered because it gave initially a small focus for a cup competition for which clubs could enter. It gave a structure in which it wasn't just random matches. I challenge you, yeah. I challenge you, and whatever. So, they, so that was the first structure and that was competitive. And I'll come back to why that worked in a second. But the second thing is the London FA and the Sheffield FA, they began to pull closely together. They played representative matches against each other in the end of the 1860s and into the 1870s. And this began a process in which the Football Association and its rules spread out of London and into other areas. And during the 1870s, by virtue of that spread and by virtue of the FA Cup, you just got a sense of a momentum building around a competition and around a structure of play and around a set of rules in which it became a badge of honour for an area to have a soccer team and to enter that soccer team in a cup competition. Yeah. And how that, how that worked was then you get local football associations being established in places like Birmingham in 1875, Staffordshire in 1877, Surrey in that same year of 1877, and then in Lancashire, crucially, in 1878. And each of those local football associations set up their own competition. And clubs began to be founded by people who already played football to enter 
in these cup, cup competitions. So you get clubs set up by local grandees, or say factory owners, set up clubs like Blackburn Olympic. Um, schools set up their, their clubs, come out, Black, both Blackburn Rovers and Chester City. Churches were involved in the founding of clubs like Everton, Wolves and Birmingham City. Cricket clubs set up football clubs for their players for the winter, like Aston Villa. And then there were a whole host of clubs which were formed around pub teams, around streets, and just by people who worked together and by groups of friends. So it, it just gathered slowly, steadily through the 1870s. It gathered a sense of momentum. And then by 1880, such was the interest, the newspapers were getting involved in covering these games. And it became a thing to go and watch your local soccer team playing in a cup competition yes. for the first time, first time ever that this happened. Okay, very interesting the way that momentum kind of just kick-started in a big way. And I, in the 1880s, the, the style of football that we're seeing, like this was not tiki-taka. Oh no, this was, um, there's a brilliant etching of, um, I suppose, an, uh, there's a brilliant etching of a match played between representative teams from England and Scotland in the 1870s. And there was a debate over whether this was actually rugby or soccer. Because the ball in both games will often be spent on the ground between a clump of players who are pushing and shoving against each other and trying to ball, drive the ball in a different way. And the idea of forming a wedge and driving the ball down the field in your feet in a cluster of eight players. So it might, soccer might have been 11 aside and it might have been played in the goal goals and there were corners, throw-ins and everything like that. That's all true. But the players were not spread out in what we consider to be modern positions. There might have been a couple of people hanging around the fringes looking for a handy ball, but the great bulk of players were in the middle at this stage, driving the ball up the field. And, um, and it, there was a sense of individualism in all of this. And players were there to prove who, who that star player was. So Alfred Littleton was one of the star players of the 1870s. And he was asked um, after an England-Scotland game why he never passed the ball. To anybody, why he never kicked the ball, he tried to rumble at the own time, and he says, "I'm playing purely for my own pleasure, sir." Hmm. And it's this idea that that of individualism, the idea of tactics and all that, is something that came in in the 1880s, and it was the arrival of Scottish players down into England, which began to transform that game, at least in some part. Right. So the Scots were tactically ahead of their counterparts. It is one of the really interesting things of of um, soccer in Britain the extent to which the game spread really quickly in Scotland at the very beginning, taken on by Queen's Park, who were avowedly amateur, and then spreading around the rest of Glasgow and Edinburgh, which, of course, of course was really um, thriving still at this point uh, as, a, as, as a country. And for almost the first hundred years of, English, of England-Scotland soccer matches, basically from the early 1870s to, the, to around 1970, England and Scotland were more or less level on head-to-head -head contests. The idea, there was a parity there between them. And the Scots developed their own particular style of play in this earlier period, and they were fated for the fact that they were more tactical. They, were more, they did try and pass the ball out. They expanded their team. They moved into more specialised positions rather than having a rut of people uh, pushed around the middle. And this helped spread the game as well. Okay. And so Gungi, just to, to kind of double back for a second, and we have, you know, the lads from Eton who uh, set up their own teams and, and when, they're, when they're adults, and then we have the factory workers playing games and the yeah. you know, different classes. So are they mixing? Are they playing each other in the same games? Is this, you know, is it still very much divided along class lines? How's all that developing? The great thing about the FA Cup is that everybody, uh, everybody was in the same competition at the same level, and it became, it became a thing to be able to, to, to have a, a really good representative team from your area compete in the FA Cup. And it's, it was clear that there was a balance of power shifting because in the early 1880s, the number of people who now come to watch soccer matches, for the first time, people coming to watch football matches rather than actually playing. Mm. It's part of that whole commercialization of sport driven by capitalists who wish to make money out of people going to watch games. People begin to charge... Uh, others in for playing the games and of course it's a matter of civic pride the newspaper industry is dramatically expanding in the 1870s and the 1880s many more people can read the newspaper so they're reading about these people who are playing football and then they wish to go and see the game yeah and then they're advertising them and then there are reports and it begins to spin on itself and 
people begin to build bigger grounds that you can charge into. There's only a couple of thousand people at the first FA Cup final. It's, it's by the 1880s, it's climbing to 15, 20,000 and continues to climb. So um, it became a thing to go to these games. And of course, it became a thing to win in front of a crowd. So the rise of the working class team, as told in a cartoon way by the, by the English game, is a real thing. Right. And I suppose the great example of working class teams is Blackburn Olympic from 1883. It was um, a team who, um, the first probably working class team who really won the, won, won the cup and it was founded and funded by the owner of the foundry. And on that team were three weavers, a spinner, an iron worker, a cotton machine operative, a picture framer, a master plumber, a clerk, a dental assistant, and a publican. So these were at least the nominal uh, professions of all the people who played the game. And they reached the final of the FA Cup in 1883, right. where they played the old, old Etonians. As the name would suggest, these were former students of, lar- at least largely, of, of Eton School. And on the Eton School team in that same FA Cup final were the, um, a, a group of lawyers, churchmen, uh, a baronet by the name of Percy de Paravenici and a professor of Latin. Now, uh, as someone who works in the university, um, professors of Latin are not renowned as, um, as sporting greats, but this, be- this was a clash of cultures mm. during, during this period. And, and um, the game ended in a draw uh, and in extra time, Blackburn Olympic won, won two, one, two goals to one. And this was the dam break of, of working class teams winning the competition. Now, it's too easy to say it's working class fee, uh, just working class fee toffs. There were, there's too much of a mixture around. Somebody had to own those teams. They weren't just all straight out of the mines onto the playing field and so on. But that contest was definitely there in the early 1880s. And so then uh, with all this um, money swirling around and this increased interest, how quickly before players stopped working in the factories and just became uh, pretty much akin to full-time professionals, when was that official? Well, it didn't happen quickly at all. From the, eight, from the late 1870s, it, it was clear, and certainly by 1880, 1881, it's, it was clear that factory owners, mill workers, various other people were um, encouraging others to come to their club giving them handy jobs, paying them boot money, a few pounds thrown in there. Yeah. Um, and basically, uh, the, like there are stories of players jogging out onto the field wearing one jersey. And by the time they get to the field, they're in another jersey because they've been bought on the way out and so right. on. But more ordinarily, it's players, it's, it's more subtle than that. It's players being enticed to live in a particular area, being given additional money, being given a handy job. And that grew in 1882, 1883, and it was clear by 1884 that it, it, was, it was rampant. All across the north of England, it was clear that the, the most successful teams, essentially, they might have been using devices such as testimonials, or they, there might have been just under the cover payments or, or whatever. But it was clear that the very best teams across the north of England were almost all paying their players in some form or other, not least because there were 55 Scots by 1884-85 season, downplaying in the north of England. Right, okay. Um, so we, we haven't really touched on rugby as we kind of begin to, to draw this period to a close. Is rugby furrowing its own way in life or what's the story there? Oh, um, rugby, what, what happened to rugby was, was, was kind of interesting. When soccer, when the Football Association was founded in 1863, rugby clubs did nothing. They just, they just, they just tipped along. They continued to play their ad hoc matches between each other um, because they felt that their game came from the particular public school to which they were affiliated. They had that certain, certain sense of themselves. There was no sense that they needed to really change a whole load of things. And even in the 1860s, if you look at, take the, the probably the 40 most important football playing clubs in, in, in England, uh, 25 of them were playing by rugby-related rules. Not a formal code, but non-FA rules uh, by the moment. And that all changed, though, in January 1871, 
when those clubs came together and founded the Rugby Football Union. Um, there were a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that of violence. But what happened were clubs in England began to abandon hacking because it was proven to just be inimical to work. It was really difficult to continue doing that. Um, number one. Number two, a surgeon wrote a letter to the newspapers at the time saying that there were too many injuries uh, in, in the rugby-based rules and it was causing death and, and injury. And then the rugby school doctor admitted that a, a boy had died um, in a match in, in, in rugby school from injuries sustained. And so this ball of clamour in the newspapers for greater organisation of, of how things should happen. That's the first thing. But second of all, a key moment happened when the Football Association of England organised a team to play against Scotland in the first ever international match in 1870, from 1870. December 1870 was organised. And this was seen by those guys playing by the rugby-related rules as being just outrageous. How they claim to wreck if they claim to rec represent England hmm. so they don't even play a proper game of football they, they don't allow you run with the ball they don't allow you hack how can that be how can they say they're the best footballers in England so this led an imp to an impetus to found the English Rugby Football Union to play a match against Scotland which duly took place the following year and those first rugby matches if, if soccer was physical and tight and competitive rugby was extraordinary rugby is 20 aside in those um early years and teams had 13 forwards so 13 forwards seven backs and in those first matches the scots the the idea that in the new rugby rules that you shouldn't hack hadn't the news hadn't quite been reached or scotland or if it had reached scotland they rejected it they hacked away so um you have rugby then established by eight by the early 1870s as a rival to soccer all the way through the 1870s uh, and into the 1880s and the number of clubs who affiliated to rugby were really strong during these years. The crowds who attended rugby matches were really strong through the 1880s on a par at their highest level with, uh, with, with, with soccer matches. So the two sports until the middle of the 1880s were perceived to be more or less in balance. Okay. Well, listen, that pretty much for time purposes brings us to a close for week four. I, the plan next week is uh, it's fascinating to get the birth of modern soccer and, and rugby to a lesser extent, but rugby all the same. The plan next week is to talk about how this hops over the pond into Ireland. Yeah, we, 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 will, look about, we will look at how um, Trinity College can lay claim to being the oldest rugby club in the world. We can look at how uh, those sports pushed in to Dublin and to Belfast and then round country towns when it comes to rugby and we can look at the origins of soccer in Belfast as a kind of what Billy Bragg would have called a northern country a, a, a northern industrial town as it was then with its shipbuilding and linen industry and how soccer spread there and then came down to Dublin largely as a middle class game and how it spread um, it spread from there afterwards and how these games spread despite the notion became current later that they were foreign games in, in inverted commas and how that fitted into the general world of, uh, of Irish sport. Okay, very good. Uh, Paul Rice, Professor at UCD School of History. Thanks, Paul.